We can't save people from just abortion and then still they're lost eternally. That's ridiculous. We're saving their lives for eternal life. So if you want a good clue as to how to find a media organization that you can trust, trust Jesus Christ. Hey, my friends. As many of you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago now, we were at March for Life. And at March for Life every year, there is something called the Law of Life Summit. You know, very often, you don't get good news in the pro-life movement. There is actually a lot of good news coming out of the legal challenges. And no team is better at doing legal challenges on pro-life issues than is Thomas More Society. Uh, they are absolutely fabulous. Um, Peter Breen, uh, Tom Breja, their group has been absolutely stellar in supporting every pro-life group out there that's worthy of the name. And the victories are stellar. So we wanted to show you this um, roundup from the lawyers at Law of Life Summit. Um, also, as a, as a snippet, I was asked to give a reason why uh, people should trust LifeSite News and how they can know what media to trust. And uh, that's there for you as well on this special episode of The John Henry Weston Show. May God bless you. And let's begin, as we always do, with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it is my honor to welcome and introduce the panel of Thomas More Society attorneys. Please give them a huge round of applause. Thank you, David. Great to see all of you here. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being interested in our, in our work. Uh, I'm going to start off by delivering a message, then I have a big announcement, and then I get to introduce a panel of superstar lawyers that I'm honored to be up here on stage with. First, a message from our founder, Tom Brecca. He gives his regards. He would like to be here himself if he could, but he can't be here this year. Um, why don't we, uh, he, may, may be, he may be watching, why don't we give him a round of applause? Now, as you know, back in 1986, the National Organization for Women sued Joe Scheidler and a bunch of pro-life activists all across the country, um, alleging that they had engaged in racketeering in violation of federal law. And Tom was, was uh, retained. He was in private practice at the time. He took on that case, eventually transitioned out of private practice, founding the Thomas More Society. And over the course of 28 years, that case went to the Supreme Court three times, ultimately resulting in a unanimous victory for the Thomas More Society and for the pro-life movement. Now, the thing that I'm happy to, to be able to stand here and announce tonight is that this is our 25th anniversary. It was 25 years ago that Tom incorporated the Thomas More Society and we got off the ground. At the beginning, it was one lawyer and one case. And now we have still headquartered in Chicago. We have offices all across the country and lawyers spread across the country. And we have cases pending in courtrooms, literally from coast to coast that we're handling all at the same time. And we owe that to Tom Brecca. Now, one of the very satisfying aspects of this job is that we get to sue states like New York and Illinois and California and do it over and over and over again. And that's some of the work that we're gonna to describe to you here. Um, you're used to seeing four Thomas More Society lawyers on, on this panel, and we have some special guests today. We have some, some uh, distinguished lawyers who are helping us with a, a particularly interesting case that you're gonna hear about tonight. Um, I think we have, a, since we have so much fun doing it, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Tom Olp, who is handling two of our really important cases, challenging state uh, overreach and abuse of government power. Tom, come on up. Thank you very much. I kind of think that um, my claim to fame is I'm involved with cases that like never end. So I came to Thomas More Society in 2015, and in 2016, our, the great state of Illinois, you know, a deep blue state, passed a law that says that pregnancy centers have to give the benefits of abortion to the women they counsel. How about that for a, for a, a law, you know, bringing into conflict the First Amendment? So in, in 2016, 
we sued uh, to, to, to stop that law and a preliminary injunction was entered in 2017. And uh, then the law, the case began to be litigated we waited for a decision in uh, Nifla v. Becerra, uh, went round and round, filed for summary judgment. Uh, it was denied by the chief judge in the Northern District of Illinois. And then finally, this fall, we finally had a trial before the judge Ian Johnston out in Rockford, Illinois. So we finally finished our briefing and we're waiting for a decision on this case. We hired some good experts and we're uh, hopeful that we're going to win this case. Seems p to be an obvious violation of the First Amendment. But this is what okay. we're facing here Hold in on. Illinois. Right. In New York, <clears throat> a similar kind of situation where uh, we w had to wait three years would, yeah, like for a decision from the Second Circuit yeah. on the case that we were litigating there. Uh, it, the, it involved the scope of an injunction. And way back in the Operation Rescue days, that would be the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, there were activities that were conducted in Rochester, New York, and Buffalo, New York, that led to an injunction that was finalized in 2005. And our client uh, came in 2017, Jim Havens and his group, and they had no uh, involvement with the named parties of that injunction. And yet the the police and Planned Parenthood there at that location in Rochester told them, you can't cross the buffer line that the injunction imposed. It's a global injunction. They contacted the Thomas More Society, and we looked up the law, went back to a, a case uh, in 1930 called Alamite and uh, decided by a, 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 an eminent jurist, learned hand, that said, you're only liable, if you're not a named party in an injunction, you're only liable and bound by it if you aid and abet a named party to violate the injunction. We told the uh, city of Rochester this. They said, okay, we'll let you guys alone. And then the state of, uh, state of New York got involved, Letitia James's people. They reversed that decision and said, we think you're in bed with the bad guys. And they said, we're going to arrest you guys if you cross that buffer line. We filed a lawsuit, and, and it was it was denied. Our case was dismissed with prejudice. And we said, this is crazy. So we appealed to the Second Circuit. And as I just said, we had to wait three years for a decision. That decision came down last August. We won. The, the dismissal was reversed, and now we're finally sitting down with the state and the city to try and work out our differences and and have a uh, modus vivendi at that abortion clinic there, Planned Parenthood in, in Rochester, so our sidewalk counselors will be able to do their job effectively. So the theme of my few words here today is it justice takes a long time to you know, to work out, and I have to say that if you're careful and you hang in and persevere, then you're liable to win out. Uh, the kind of primary example of that is the uh, uh, Now v. Scheidler case that our founder Tom Breckett was involved in. Guess long, how long it took? Twenty eight years, and three times to the Supreme Court. So we here at Thomas More. Uh, we're here for the long term. We're going to work hard to win these cases because, you know, there's a stiff wind, as you know, against the pro-life movement. So we're well aware of that and and proceeding and knowing that. So anyway, that's enough of my, for me. I turn it over to Peter Breen, who's a, a colleague and has similar stories, I think. Thank you, Tom. And my, my name is Peter Breen. I'm your executive vice president, head of litigation for Thomas More Society. You know, last year at this time, uh, we were uh, frantically preparing to defend Mark Houck uh, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania in downtown Philadelphia 
uh, and praise God, we were able to get a not guilty verdict uh, in that case and absolutely, you know, lay one on the Biden Department of Justice. Uh, but but I will tell you, you know, we we have, uh, you know, the stakes are only higher with each passing month. You know, and David B. Wright referred to the fact that, you know, abortion, uh, we had, you know, we had hoped the abortion rates would continue to go down. They've kind of bottomed out and we uh, were seeing a little bit of an upswing. And I'll tell you, you know, you're, you're hearing a lot tonight uh, about California, Illinois, and New York. And now maybe California and New York are obvious to you because they're big abortion states, have been since pre-Roe, and they're just large states generally. The reason you're also going to hear about Illinois, not just because we, we happen to be headquartered there in the middle of the country, which gives us easy access to both ends of the country, uh, but it's because the abortion rate in Illinois has absolutely skyrocketed. And if you look at the month-by-month -month data, that is coming out lately, Illinois is on track to double its abortion rate from before Dobbs. So you're looking at Illinois possibly, maybe even getting into the number three slot in the country, even though Illinois is, what, a quarter of the size of California, or a third of the size of California, half the size of New York and Florida, probably going to be right up there uh, at 100,000 abortions a year, possibly, from a traditional rate of about 40. And so you're seeing this, though, this is this divide in the country, the red state versus blue state. And I don't mean to use those politically. I mean to use them in the pro-life terminology, maybe. Uh, and so for us at Thomas More Society, you know, the, the idea of representing sidewalk counselors and helping pregnancy centers and the movement uh, to fight states where uh, abortion is legal, you know, that's kind of the thing we were doing before Dobbs. But uh, the, the vigor with which these states, these blue states are coming after our people, has intensified times 10. I mean, and you see, I mean, we had already seen under the Obama administration, you know, this somewhat of a disregard for the rule of law, a disregard for, for proper process and principles. And so, so that they would think, well, you know, we don't want to do it to you because then it'll be done back to us. Now they just don't care in these states for the most part. And so you see that in the blue states, you know, the red states, the, the pro-life states, we're having wonderful success. Uh, you know, we'd like to do a little more. We're, we're helping people with drafting legislation, but we're doing offensive work. But it's really those blue states right now where we are focusing our efforts because they are, are undertaking in particular, uh, so not just, uh, say, the face case violations, which you're going to hear about uh, as well uh, from my colleague Martin Cannon. You know, we've got uh, FACE Act prosecutions, both civil and criminal, that we are defending across the country, both against the Department of Justice and against state attorneys general. But they're coming after pregnancy centers. And really, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and as part of the, the effort, say, I want to give you a case study in Illinois because it's uh, a wonderful victory that was just won. But it's against the most recent uh, brand of anti-pregnancy center legislation that is going through the states. They're trying to stop the pregnancy centers from doing their work generally. You know, and these are small nonprofits. So if you if you impose a lot of uh, legal restrictions and the threats of fines or even jail time or what have you, uh, folks just recede. You know, they're volunteers for the most part. They might not have enough money or legal resources to combat, you know, the entire weight of the sovereign state of California or New York or Illinois. Uh, but they are doing this work really uh, attacking pregnancy centers in a couple of ways. And, and the newest uh, way that this is being framed as is they are that pregnancy centers are violating your state deceptive practices act. So in other words, it's this whole business. The other side doesn't want to engage on the issues. They just say, oh, you're lying. You're lying. And in particular, they're challenging things like our characterization of abortion. In the state of Illinois, uh, we had a bill this, this past year called Senate Bill 1909. It was enacted at the behest of Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul, who was a liberal Democrat, and proudly signed by uh, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, a name you may know because he is on the short list of Democratic presidential candidates, multi-billionaire, uh, you know, heir to the Hyatt uh, family fortune. And so that law declared that pregnancy centers were overstating the risks of abortion and using misinformation. Gosh, where have we heard that lately? Um, you know, and, but putting it into state statute uh, and even saying, well, 
the pregnancy centers are saying falsely that abortion could lead to infertility. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, this is a pretty well-educated pro-life room. If you botch an abortion, oftentimes it could lead to infertility, but they didn't even care. And you were sitting there, you're just looking at them going, what are you people thinking? Uh, and then, you know, they were trying to, you know, peddle lies like, oh, well, uh, you know, childbirth is much more dangerous than a surgical abortion, which is outlandish. And, and most of us, you know, we've seen the studies, we've debunked them, what have you. But uh, they enacted this into law. So they essentially put into law saying what we know to be false is true and you must adhere to it. And if you don't, we're going to subject you to $50,000 fines, ruinous investigations. We're going to issue subpoenas on you and what have you. And this was looking like an existential threat to the pregnancy center movement in Illinois in particular. But it's a, a similar law has been enacted in states like Connecticut and Vermont and other places like that. So we desperately fought when we were thinking we've got to beat this in Illinois because it's probably the worst of its kind in the country in hopes of stopping it in other states. It's also being considered in certain other state legislatures. Well, we were able and showed what the pro-life movement can do, even in a blue state, even when you're down two to one in your legislature. Our activists on the ground were working the phones. Folks put, put lots of witness slips in. We had 17,000 witness slips against this bill, 3,000 in favor. And we had the right people testifying. We had the right record come in. The legislators, the, the good pro-life core there in the Illinois General Assembly were asking the right questions. They did the good floor debate. And then we as the lawyers were able to look and go, hey, let's get this evidence in. Uh, we filed you know, uh, with our friends of the Pro-Life Action League, who became our clients in this case, because the law also impacted sidewalk counselors. We filed FOIA requests and got documents to help make our case. At the end of the day, as against the attorney general who had claimed, we've had scores of reports and complaints about your deceptive practices, you pregnancy centers. Our evidence, FOIA request results, showed there had actually been no complaints, not a single one in 10 years. And so we took all of this to the federal district court in the Northern District of Illinois. So the, the bill was signed on July 27th at noon. We filed our lawsuit and sought a permanent injunction, preliminary and permanent injunction at 1 p.m., and at 2 p.m., the attorney general got up to talk about his wonderful bill. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I put this to you because it, it's important to see us actually score points in a blue state. The AG got one softball question at his press conference, and every other question was about our lawsuit, about what the pro-life movement was doing. And we were able to reframe that debate and really reshape the way this thing was being covered in, in, a, in a hard blue state like Illinois. Yeah, and that is something to be, a, be proud of. Sorry. I'm not leaving you time, you know, time to applaud. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a politician, too, or a reform politician. Uh, and so, but I'll tell you, a week later, we get a hearing, and we're there in the district court, six-hour hearing. Uh, we had our friends, uh, you know, uh, our friends from NIFLA uh, were one of the parties there and, you know, flew in from New Jersey. We had local, uh, the folks from the Pro-Life Action League there, uh, local pro-life sidewalk counseling group, another local pregnancy center. Had him up on the stand. We asked a lot of questions. The judge was asking a lot of questions. He was very engaged. And at the end of the hearing, and you know, Thursday night, six o'clock, he gives us a preliminary injunction against that law. And it was a wonderful victory. And he then issued his written decision the next day. And he said, you know, uh, sometimes uh, there are laws where uh, Justice Scalia had said, you know, I wish I had a stamp that said this law is stupid, but it's constitutional. And the judge said, well, this one's stupid and it's unconstitutional. And so that was a wonderful victory for us. And wouldn't you know it, state of Illinois came back, said, we're going to take 25 depositions, four expert witnesses. We're going to we're going to put you through the ringer. Well, a few weeks later and a little more, you know, we kind of fought back on them on a lot of these things. They have now since agreed to drop the drop the law, agree to a permanent injunction and pay us our attorney's fees for the trouble. So, yeah, I. I give you that look. I mean, that one, this was a good win. It was a good, hard win. And, and frankly, you know, we started the year with Mark Halk winning, you know, when we got the right jury seated, it was an hour, not guilty up against the DOJ that has a 98, 99% win rate. And we're kind of closing the year with this incredible win in Illinois, where we just absolutely, you know, cleaned their clocks, got them to admit it and stopped one of the worst laws against pregnancy centers in the country. I do that to show you we can win these fights and we take the opportunities and absolutely drive it home. 
Um, I'll tell you, you know, the, every time Merrick Garland gets in front of Congress, they ask him about Mark Houck, still. And they're going to keep asking him about it. And in Illinois, it's an absolute black eye. So every time the pro boards get up there and want to run another bill, the, you know, the legislators are kind of privately grumbling on, are you going to get a suit again? Are we going to get embarrassed again? So this is the sort of thing that we're glad and you know, honored to be able to do for you and pleased to be able to do. We're going to keep doing it in the year to come. You know, we've got challenges in California, state of California. The California Attorney General has sued Heartbeat International. I mean, the, the, the mega uh, pregnancy center network of 3,000 centers, which does wonderful work, they want to shut down abortion pill reversal, saying it's, again, a deceptive practice to help people try to save their babies when they decide that they don't want to have an abortion anymore. Uh, so we are working very hard in that. You're going to hear more about that in the months uh, the months to come. But again, I, I just thank you so much. Please keep the faith. And again, think of these great victories, and let's hope we uh, get a few more in this year to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. It's great to have big wins to crow about. Uh, we're proud of our victories, and uh, we are in the process of filing more lawsuits to deliver more victories. Um, Several years ago, New York passed its awful RHA, and our phones exploded. Uh, we got calls from New York asking us to do something. Uh, other law firms were engaged, and everybody said there was nothing that lawyers could do about this. Well, we thought long and hard and decided we we're going to be creative, and uh, that's why we have two esteemed guest uh, lawyers up here to tell you about what we ended up doing in New York and what we're doing now. Uh, Michelle Sterlis Acorsi is the executive director of Feminist Choosing Life of New York. Um, they weren't satisfied passing the awful RHA, a, a bill through the, the legislature. Now they have a ballot initiative to enshrine abortion in their constitution. Michelle is uh, a campaign, campaign consultant to the Coalition to Protect Kids New York, which was commissioned to defeat the New York Equal Rights Amendment, which is their pro-abortion ballot initiative. Uh, Michelle is, is a lawyer herself, a mom, and a very effective pro-life activist. Michelle, come on up. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to read my um, brief comments here quickly. Um, on January 22nd, 2019, the New York State Legislature enacted the Reproductive Health Act, or the RHA, um, an abortion expansion policy that for years had been held at bay by only a few votes in the New York State Senate. Former New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo, in office at the time, lit up the World Trade Center in pink to celebrate the passage of the RHA. An historical achievement, according to pro-abortion special interests, but a move towards death and danger for unborn children and pregnant women. The RHA in New York dehumanizes unborn children and jeopardizes the health and well-being of women. Among other things, the RHA repealed New York's long-standing fetal homicide law and created a new definition of person under New York criminal law, which excludes all unborn children, including viable unborn children, from the legal definition of persons who can be victims of homicide. The change altered nearly 200 years of New York law. The RHA permits killing children capable of surviving outside of the wombs of their mothers with or without medical intervention for reasons wholly unrelated to any threat to their mother's physical life or health. Essentially, the RHA permits on-demand abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. The RHA repealed New York's long-standing requirement that only duly licensed physicians perform abortions and permits a largely undefined category of healthcare professionals to perform any and all abortions, including later second and third trimester abortions, nearly 2,000 of which occur in New York on average annually. Shortly after the passage of the RHA, Feminists Choosing Life of New York organized a legal team 
to explore the legality of this law. The legal team led by the most brilliant attorney, Teresa Collette, here today, who will speak to y'all after me, discovered several areas to attack the RHA that would protect children and women. Our incredible, incredible friends at the Thomas More Society took on the matter and shortly thereafter filed a class action lawsuit against the RHA on behalf of vulnerable victim plaintiffs. The class action lawsuit titled Smith versus Hochul filed on several U.S. constitutional grounds, represented the first time a New York abortion law was challenged for violating both women's rights and the rights of unborn children. Among other things, the lawsuit claims the RHA deprives viable unborn children of their right to live free from lethal violence and incentivizes domestic and intimate partner violence against pregnant women. Plaintiffs challenged two portions of the RHA, claiming these two provisions violated three constitutional protections, substantive due process, equal protection, and the right to legal redress. As expected, the case was dismissed by the lower court, as are the majority of challenges to abortion laws in the United States. Most notable, however, the federal district court where the case was filed agreed with plaintiffs that there is a substantial likelihood that by eliminating the fetal homicide law the RHA reduced disincentives for violence against pregnant women, making it more likely that third parties will inflict violence against pregnant women. Further, the lower court declined to rule on whether viable unborn children can be represented, holding instead that neither the proposed representatives in the complaint nor the attorneys for the children could speak on their behalf. On April 21st, 2023, the matter was taken up on appeal before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, where oral argument is expected to occur in February of this year. The appeal involved is ultimately asking the court, and Teresa will go into further detail, to recognize the right to life for viable unborn children under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, a right for these children to live free from violent destruction at the hands of criminals attacking pregnant women and from those who would kill them at the request of their mothers and to identify who can speak on behalf of viable unborn children in a court of law, exactly who can present their claim to live free from violent destruction. This case is a fight for the voiceless, a chance to rehumanize unborn children, an opportunity to protect more kids from death, a chance to protect pregnant women from violence. Smith versus Hochul is potentially one step closer to the U.S. Supreme Court, and please pray that we will prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it was very frustrating that within days of the passage of the RHA in New York, a number of law firms announced that there was nothing lawyers could do about it. And we knew it was gonna be quite a challenge, and uh, we, uh, realized that we were different than those other law firms in many ways, one of which is we have Teresa Collette in our corner. And we we turned to Professor Collette, and uh, she has come through. Now we're going to get to some detailed uh, law talk here uh, so that we can understand just uh, just how what a what a steep climb we took on. and uh, and we're real proud that we are the one process. Uh, uh, prosecuting this lawsuit. Now, Teresa is a professor of law at the uh, Un University of St. Thomas, where she d directs the Pro-Life Law Center there. She teaches constitutional law and bioethics. She served as uh, Assistant Attorney General for the states of Oklahoma and Kansas, and she frequently represents states who are defending their pro-life laws. Teresa, come on up here.
I wasn't aware that my mother had called everybody on the panel. Uh, that very generous introduction it overstates the case because working with uh, both Michelle and with the Thomas More lawyers has just been a delight and I've learned a lot from them. So I'm very fortunate to be working as a part of the, their team on this matter. But I am gonna sort of geek out on the law. So for those of you who are not lawyers in the room or don't aspire to be lawyers, forgive me. I'll try to keep it reasonably understandable, but for the law students, pay attention. Let's start with uh, a recent debate that occurred in National Review between Clark Forsyth and uh, not Josh Blackman, but uh, Craddock, Josh Craddock. And the question was, is personhood the right next battle for the pro-life movement? When we took this case up on appeal, the trial court, as Michelle said, had declined to answer whether or not unborn children could ever have a guardian ad litem or a legal representative. And there's a good reason for that because there's a long multi-century history of unborn children having guardian ad litems or next friends, particularly in probate and trust. And so to say that unborn children can never have legal representatives would simply be to defy two centuries of law. Instead, the judge said, I am reserving that question, but the person that you have nominated to be that legal representative doesn't have a sufficient relationship with the unborn children who are members of this class, so she can't be appointed. We argued that, Your Honor, the fact that she counsels women who are in violent relationships, women who are uh, being coerced regarding continuation of their pregnancy, gives her a sufficient relationship. And the judge said, no, I don't believe that's so. I said, well, in the event that's not true, Your Honor, there is multiple precedent for the lawyers in the case to represent those individuals. So consider us the legal representatives. Now, the reason this is important is because you have to have someone legally competent to speak in court and unborn children can't speak on their own behalf. By avoiding appointing anyone, what the court essentially did is say that children, their right to plead for their lives before the court is conditioned upon the court being willing to grant them a representative. This cannot be the law. Every American has a right to appear in court and plead their case. So we took it up on appeal on that specific issue was a special relationship under these circumstances required? And if so, had we, fought, had we adequately established it? The New York Attorney General changed the question, which was a very interesting move on their part. He changed the question in that he came back and said, she came back, I'm sorry, Letitia James came back and said, whether there's enough of a relationship or not is irrelevant because they're not constitutional persons. So they can't make constitutional claims. Now the law students in the room will remember that one of the holdings in Roe versus Wade was in fact, can unborn children be considered constitutional persons for purposes of the 14th amendment? And so the entire defense of the appeal on the part of New York was that Roe said they, they're not constitutional persons and therefore you're not obligated to appoint a representative. They can't make these claims. And so we're done. What's interesting is that of course, Dobbs overruled Roe in toto. The concurring opinion by Chief Justice Roberts basically <laughs> pleaded with the majority, please don't do that. Just overrule it partially. Let's do this gradually. Let's be very careful. And Justice Alito said, no, no, it's gone in toto, which is our reply brief. That in fact, the question of the personhood of the unborn as of Dobbs is now an open question again in federal courts. And we learned from the abortion industry. Our complaint ran 120 pages and had expert declarations that were attached that established 
the biological identity of these unborn children as human beings and in being, which were the requirements of a U.S. Supreme Court just five years before Roe versus Wade, when the question was whether or not illegitimate children in Virginia had a right to inherit. And the court said, the Virginia said they're non-persons because they're not legitimate. And the court said, no, they are not non-persons because they're human beings and they're in being. We meet that qualification. Is the court ready in the Second Circuit to give us a ruling that our tiny, tiny clients are in fact constitutional persons for the 14th Amendment? We pray they are. But if the court isn't ready, we've at least begun to lay the groundwork. Because any law student can tell you the main way you get to the US Supreme Court is where you have a split of authority in various circuit courts. And I think the Fifth Circuit's our next stop if we need to get that split of authority. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, we need your prayer support for, for that lawsuit and for, for all of the all our others for that matter. Uh, back in the 80s, there was a, a, a practice that spread nationwide of doing sit-ins at abortion clinics and shutting them down. You physically obstruct the entrance so they can't get in, they can't do business. Um, that that uh, the magnitude of those sit-ins grew so that by 1991, we had the Summer of Mercy at George Tiller's Clinic in Wichita, Kansas. 92, we had where then hundreds of people showed up and dozens were arrested every day. Uh, the next summer, it spread to Milwaukee and other cities where thousands would show up and hundreds would be arrested in, in a day, and then they'd be processed, charged with uh, trespassing or disturbing the peace and processed and come back the next day and, and do it again. And they were very public about what their intent was and what they were doing. Uh, then in uh, 1993, uh, Dr. Taylor was shot in the arm in Wichita and Dr. David Gunn was shot to death in Pensacola. And Teddy Kennedy introduced the FACE Act in the Senate and Chuck Schumer introduced it in the House and it was assigned into law in 1994. So who here, let's see a show of hands, has heard of this obscure federal law called the FACE Act? Yes, pretty much everybody. Now, under our scheme of separation of powers, those powers known as the police powers are generally reserved to the states. So if you are tried for murder, rape, robbery, assault and battery, you're probably gonna be tried in a state court under state law. Now, there are exceptions. If you commit your crime on federal property, then you might be in federal court. But generally, that's how things work. Now, they passed the FACE Act, and of course, I'm asking the question, where do they get off thinking they have the power to do that? And so we're going to tell you about how our efforts to have the FACE Act declared unconstitutional. Now, at the same time, there's been a bill introduced in Congress uh, to repeal the FACE Act, and there's been an appropriations amendment introduced to defund the FACE Act. So um, I'm not sure if we can get that through Congress as it currently stands, uh, but it's good that it's there. Congress itself is questioning the constitutionality of the FACE Act. That's the justification, the, the motivation for filing this bill. Um, we have a number of FACE Act cases that we are defending, and they came in a wave after the Dobbs decision was rendered when people were uh, urging the administration to do something. And so we, we've we've suffered what I think has had an egregious abuse of government power where this law, which is unconstitutional in the first place, is being misused against a lot of people. And we have uh, a great um, number of really skilled lawyers that are pushing back on this, representing people in courts all across the country. And we have our next speaker is the guy I call the king of the sidewalks, Martin Cannon. Come on up here and tell us about the face -in. Whenever you speak after Andy Bath, you got to pull the microphone back down. Uh, I'm going to brag for just a minute about the Thomas More Society. A few years ago, there was actually a pretty well-researched, very pro-abortion uh, article put out by an outfit I can't remember, but it's rather significant. And they researched all the FACE cases everywhere in the country that had been prosecuted since the FACE Act was passed. And at the time, this is a couple of years ago, the government... Or, or some government, I think it included uh, state attorneys general, 
had prosecuted right at 100 face cases, and they had won 95 of them. The, the takeaway from that is government doesn't lose face cases. Of the five that the government had lost, three of them were Thomas More cases. <clears throat> And, and these aren't small cases. These aren't something where you go down the sidewalk and you step into the courtroom and try your case for half an hour or an afternoon and you get a verdict and go home. These take months and months of preparation, hundreds of thousands of dollars of expense, not attorney fees, maybe expense uh, paying local counsel to be around. Uh, weeks and weeks in hotel rooms and taxis and airfare and stuff. It's a big deal when the U.S. government or any government prosecutes a client with something that risks... 10 years in prison. Uh, so it's a big deal. Since Dobbs, and actually since it became apparent a little bit ahead of time that Roe was going away, the DOJ prosecution of face cases has exploded. They created their own separate face department, and they've got their own face people that are running around the country charging, charging people with the FACE Act and trying those cases. Uh, now, since then, we've won another one, the Hout case that you all know about. Uh, I want to go quickly to kind of go through a rundown of the TMS face cases because it really creates a big picture that you have to see. Uh, Father Westland, this goes back 10 or 15 years. Father Westland was a Catholic priest charged with face because he went into a clinic in Omaha and kneeled down to pray, you know, a terrible violent crime. Uh, the, 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 the BS in the allegations against him somewhat uniquely, actually came in that case from clinic escorts. Uh, we won that case, uh, tried it to a federal jury over the course of a week or so. Uh, we, we won it. Uh, the next one was the Ken Scott case in Colorado. Interestingly, this was under the Obama administration. And the Obama administration uh, pretty much sent out a memo to all their local state U.S. attorneys saying, when people offer a pamphlet to a car going into a driveway, and that car stops, that's blockage. That's a face violation. Uh, so we're going to take this approach. One of their first cases on that was the Ken Scott case, charging him with face because he handing pamphlets out to people who voluntarily stopped their cars when he didn't step in front of the car to, to, to force it to stop. We won that case, and the tactic kind of faded. We still hear the argument once in a while, but it's but it's not one that the DOJ is is advancing anymore. Uh, our next case was the Greep case in New York. It wasn't a DOJ case. It was the New York Attorney General, probably the most powerful attorney general in the country. Uh, their approach was our clients on a 16-foot wide sidewalk, standing at the edges of the sidewalk, leaving about 15 feet available for people to walk into the clinic, just their being there, holding signs, preaching a little bit uh, from the edge of the sidewalk, just their being there was intimidation and therefore had to be a face violation. Uh, that attorney general, Ken, uh, or uh, 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 Schneiderman, on the day he filed that lawsuit, he held a press conference with all the abortionists and escorts and everybody from the clinic behind him on that very sidewalk. And he said, this is a quote, we do not live in a country where you can choose your point of view. And they held, they acted like the mere filing of that lawsuit was the victory. And of course, they had another thing coming about a year and a half later uh, when we won that case. Uh, and, and interesting, interestingly, we're all looking at the same videos. The DOJ, or in that case, the, the Attorney General's office, literally misrepresented facts that were right there on video. It's like they live in a different reality. And, and our trial judge said at the end of a long case, she rendered a 100-page opinion saying, your witnesses aren't believable. You're misrepresenting what's going on here, and you're not going to get your injunction. But it took a lot of work to do that. Uh, the next one after that was the Hout case. Of course, you all know what the Hout case is. The, the commonality here is continued. The, the prosecution as a face case was an egregious reach. It was an egregious abuse of the law, trying to make it fit facts that are not intended to be in, in, uh, included in the face case. 
the next one is that fairly recently we tried the Lauren Handy case. Uh, in that case, again, DOJ, from this point forward, it's all DOJ. After, after GREEP, uh, as soon as Dobbs started looking like it was going to happen, the DOJ exploded, and these are all DOJ cases. Uh, so Hauk was DOJ. Handy was DOJ also. And Handy and people that were charged with her went into the clinic, and they sat down. Interestingly enough, two, maybe, allegedly actually blocked something. But rather inarguably, the other eight did not. Now, a, a, a prosecutor has a duty to the prospective defendants, just as he has a duty to the, the community at large, not to over-prosecute. He's got prosecutorial discretion. He's supposed to, he's supposed to employ it temperately, but we don't see that in these cases where he's got two people he may be able to charge with face and eight that he really ought to push off to the state and charge them with trespass if they want. He doesn't do that. Without the facts to support the face conviction itself, what they do instead is charge him with conspiracy. Anybody who was anything around, anywhere around the thing, gets charged with conspiracy, and that's the same as being charged with face, even though there was no conspiracy. In that case, there was no agreement. The evidence didn't support anything but an agreement that whatever we do, 10 people, we're all going to do our own thing, whatever you want to do, the only real agreement was to be peaceful. But it doesn't matter. We're going to rope them all in. Uh, the next case is a, a face case we're actually getting ready to try starting next Monday in a couple of days. That's in Tennessee. Almost exactly the same facts. Two people allegedly uh, did some blocking. The others weren't. And they didn't even go into the clinic. You know, this is this is out in public areas. So that's a big a big deal. It's a it's a stretch on the facts. And how's the DOJ handling it? Conspiracy again. We have an Ohio civil case coming up. Uh, it's just a civil case, but the DOJ is pushing it, of course. They've sent letters to our clients saying, we're going to sue you for a face violation. And what that means, since it's a civil case, it could become a criminal case later. But in the civil realm, what it means is they're going to be seeking an injunction and they're going to be seeking a judgment for a bunch of money. Now, the big picture here is abuse of the process, abuse of people who are as entitled to the protections from the from government as the people the government is com is fixated on protecting one sidedly. It is abuse. It is egregious. It is not good faith. Now, a few of these cases I've heard people say in the Handy case or maybe the Tennessee case. Well, good grief. If people are going into the clinics, why are you defending them? Uh, they go in there. They know that it's probably illegal. They're going in there to make trouble. Aren't they willingly breaking the law? Aren't they making pro-lifers look like radicals? Shouldn't they rely on lawful means? The answer to that question affects everyone in this room, and it's multi-parted. I'm going to try and go quickly. First of all, the people watching a pregnant woman walk into a clinic are looking at an actual baby, not a hypothetical baby. The defense of others' idea, which is born in natural law, is real, it's compelling, and it's what they act upon. When you're watching a real baby about to be killed, you don't go outside and call your congressman or write a letter to the editor. You act. Now, in most cases, we confront a problem there. It's a barrier to using that defense, and that is that killing that baby is legal. If it's legal, you don't really get the defense of others argument. And, and you know, there are ways you might be able to, but pretty much it's a loser. The second answer to why we defend them, though, is that if the killing of that baby is actually illegal, then the law provides and, the, and your duty says you intervene. You intervene. Where the evidence is that babies are not being killed legally, but being killed illegally, born alive and left to die. And the evidence of that is very strong. It was very strong in the Handy case. Face doesn't even apply. There's no argument that that is reproductive health care. Face defines reproductive health services as dealing with a pregnancy. But a baby outside the womb living at any stage, and even for 30 seconds, is not a pregnancy. This is a human being who has all the rights to protection that anyone in this room has. So you can do your blocking. 
You can do your trespassing. You can chain yourself to doors. That is not unlawful. So in those situations, the people that we would represent there are not using unlawful means. They are using lawful means, but they are charged with a crime. Third part of that answer is that if only some people block, but all are charged, don't these people de deserve defense? Fourth answer to that, no rule says that all pro-lifers have to do things exactly the same way. People speak the language they heard. People get into the pro-life business because something affected them. A sign of an aborted baby, a, a picture of a non-aborted baby, some argument that somebody made, a printed sign, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. But people will tend to go into the pro-life movement doing things in the way that they got brought into by. So, so that's pretty important. And the variety of approaches to the thing really reflects the depth and complexity and fundamental nature of the pro-life view. When we come at it from a hundred different directions, it's harder for the other side to just dismiss it or ignore it as the unilateral ravings of, you know, a, a kind of a one-sided group. Fifth answer, and there's only one more after this, defending people works. When, when Father Wesselin was first charged, he was charged by the state with trespass. But the federal government came down with all their power and they took it away from the state and they charged him with his face, face sack. It created a much bigger, much more complex trial. But we won it. A year later, Father Wesselin went in to the same clinic and did exactly the same thing. He was one of these wonderful, indefatigable guys that was just going to do this. He did the exact same thing. The feds wouldn't touch it. We went in and pled him guilty to trespass, and a nice judge fined him 25 bucks, and it was done. Trying cases, winning cases especially, keeps the other side a little more honest. They don't want to waste their resources. They don't want to work hard. They don't want to get embarrassed. Finally, and this applies, kind of wraps up the whole idea that everybody in this room ought to care about. If we didn't defend people out on the edges, people I like to call the rascals, and if we didn't have the victories, the government that spends all its time coming after them would be coming after you. I'm not doing anything illegal, so I have nothing to worry about is not a realistic approach in the face of a lawless and abusive government. This is why we need the Thomas More Society. And this is why. Finally, with Dobbs, the federal underpinnings for the FACE Act itself have gone away. That is not a strained argument. It's a decent argument. And we're taking that up. So stay tuned on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well delivered. Uh, you can see why I'm uh, honored to work alongside these people. Uh, we've come to the end of our time here. I want to urge you to go to our website, www.thomasmoresociety.org. More has one O and it's .org, not .com. You can sign up for our emails, follow our work. Uh, you can support us by, uh, there's a tab that will allow you to donate in, in a variety of different ways. You can support us financially. Also, uh, you hear me say this every year, we're really proud of all these victories. Uh, proud of our lawsuits, proud of our wins, proud of our clients that are out there putting it on the line. Uh, but we realize that even our biggest courtroom victories are just minor skirmishes in what is really a much larger spiritual battle. So please support us with your prayers. Thank you. I've known John Henry for a long, long time. He is the uh, one of the founders and uh, editors at uh, LifeSite News. And so, John, what we want to know about the media is so slanted. It's so corrupt. I look at the headlines. I see the AP, the talking points from the Associated Press. If you guys don't know, they actually published a topical guide instructing their, their reporters not to use the phrase pro-life. You are to refer to pro-lifers as anti-abortion. And so you can see the articles. Jeannie Mancini was in an article earlier today. Anti-abortion, Jeannie Mancini, right? 
they can't say anything positive about the pro-life movement because that would destroy their narrative. So I want to ask John Henry Weston, um, what can we do? What are you doing to address this gaping gap of ethics in, in the media? Thank you, Royce. And thank you to all of you who have for so many years already defended life in America. As your third Canadian mentioned in like the last five minutes, I think this is really cool. Great opportunity to follow Abby Johnson. Always a hard act to follow, but someone great and inspirational to follow. See, Abby talked about something right off the bat, which is absolutely central to how to discern what is proper when it comes to media. And it's not going to be popular to say. The answer is Jesus Christ. It is the only way. You know, in the pro-life movement in Canada, we tried. We tried because the, the, our pro-life march started in 1997. We tried to do it without Jesus. We tried to say to those people coming with posters of Our Lady or a statue or a crucifix, don't do that. Just keep that away. We want, take this pro-life sign instead. A lot of them stayed home because of that. God bless them because it taught us a lesson. Here in America, where everything was free, everybody came with everything. There's a huge a statue being carried by guys. I don't know how they do that, by the way, for the whole march, but it's amazing. When I go to Italy at the March for Life, they do that too, but they dance the whole way and carry a big statue of Our Lady. Those guys are heroes. But it is actually the answer. If you want to know what we're doing in the pro-life movement, we're evangelizing. That is what we're doing. What did Bernard Nathanson, what did Abby Johnson come to? They came to faith. They came because of faith. We can't save people from just abortion. And then still, they're lost eternally. That's ridiculous. We're saving their lives for eternal life. So if you want a good clue as to how to find a media organization that you can trust, trust Jesus Christ. At LifeSite News, our mission is evangelization. News is actually there as a hook to evangelize. And when you start with Jesus, you bring the truth. Because you can't do anything else because you offend the truth himself. And so that's our mission. And obviously, we go to defend the greatest attacks on truth with a capital T, the greatest attacks on Jesus Christ. And what is a little known, perhaps, uh, vision given to three children in Fatima in 1917, the mother of God from heaven came to tell these little children the greatest or the final battle between our Lord and the reign of Satan will be over marriage and the family. The very issues that you fight every day are the very issues that are the decisive final battle. And that's why it's so demonic. You ever wonder why this insane ferocity? Why? And you will have seen the, the abortionists or sidewalk counselors, whatever they are. They're nearly foaming at the mouth. They're saying the most obscene things. Why? You've watched this. Whether they know it or not, as we already heard up here, it's not about knowing that you're working with the evil one. He doesn't care. In fact, he enjoys it more when he's thought not to exist. This whole battle is about one thing. We need to be about Jesus Christ, about evangelization. And that's why the most powerful thing in the pro-life movement works. It's the same thing Jesus did. Telling stories. The stories and the images. You know that the church is all about images. You know that in every church there's a crucifix the most horrific scene of death you can ever see. 
That's why in the pro-life movement, we have the signs that have converted so many people. They're able to see what it is that we're doing a million times a year, every year, to children in this country alone. So media is there to serve as a tool for bringing the truth. The only trustworthy media is the media that serves to bring you to the ultimate truth. And outside of that, there will always be lies. We started LifeSite News in 1997. The whole reason why we started is because the same year was started the March for Life in Canada, a copycat of what you guys are doing right here. And they lie consistently in our media that it didn't happen. That if it did happen, it was like five people. The news cameras that came, they would focus on the corner where there is probably five people having a smoke, likely, and not behind them. And they literally do this stuff because that's what they're about. We've watched, especially over the past three or four years, the media lies in ways you'd never thought possible. No, they wouldn't. They didn't. They did. They did with the absolute utter collusion of the media owners. You've watched, how many of you have seen these videos where all the news media are parroting the same line? You guys seen that? Hands up if you saw it. A lot of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it yet, boy, oh boy. Every news anchor parroting the same line. And the line is a lie. Because they're trying purposefully to give you misinformation, disinformation. Media is about trust. LifeSite News has been there now for 26 years, trying to provide the truth, especially to those whom we serve. And that is, first and foremost, those in the movement for life and family. For LifeSite News, I'm John Henry Weston. And may God bless you.